Well, hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's great to be with you on this Thursday, April 21st. And tonight, we're talking about the future of Florida. Disney World could take a major hit for its stance on protecting LGBTQ children. A bill before the governor would radically change how the resort is governed. Meanwhile, Florida's new congressional map prompted a protest. Black lawmakers say it would decimate their districts. We need a formal recess. We are in formal recess. Sergeant, please secure the chamber. We will explain this big day at the Florida State House and we'll hear from people on both sides of the Disney debate. Also tonight, President Biden says he is sending more aid to the Ukrainians, $800 million worth. How much will that help slow down Russia's new troop movements in eastern Ukraine? We're live with the latest. And it's just one more thing in short supply these days. From filling party balloons to making microchips, the world needs a lot more helium. Walt Disney once described Disney World as a showcase to the world of the American free enterprise system. Soon, Florida's lawmakers could change that showcase in ways he probably never imagined. Today, the state house voted to get rid of Disney's special tax status. The measure is on Governor Ron DeSantis' desk for signature, and this would change how Disney World has existed for its entire history. All of this came about after Disney's CEO, Bob Chapek, pushed back against the parental rights in education law. Critics call the measure the don't say gay bill. It restricts classroom discussions of sexual orientation and gender identity. The Walt Disney World Resort sits inside its own self-governing body, the Reedy Creek Improvement District. It kind of lives where that dot is between Orange and Osceola counties. Now, the bill that passed today would dissolve that district. Next month makes 55 years since Florida signed the district into law, and it gives Disney enormous control over its Florida resort, very different from Disneyland in California. Among other things, Reedy Creek in Florida can collect taxes to pay for police, fire, and roadways, and it has significant exemptions from zoning regulations. But that was just one big move the Florida House made today. Republican lawmakers also passed another key part of Governor DeSantis's agenda, a new congressional map. It's been controversial for its potential impact on black voters in Orlando's 10th congressional district and in North Florida's 5th congressional district. As the House prepared to vote, Democrats disrupted the proceedings. Critics say the new districts will reduce minority representation. We need a formal recess. We are in formal recess. Sergeant, please secure the chamber. In a moment, we will hear from a state lawmaker who sponsored the Disney bill in the House. And we'll hear from one of the state's top LGBTQ advocacy groups. But let's begin in Florida with NBC senior national political reporter Mark Caputo. And Mark, I wonder, first of all, what the early read is on the impact of this, particularly on people who live in Orange and Osceola counties. What's the read there? We have no idea. Orange and Osceola have no idea. Disney has no idea. The state has no idea. One of the things about the legislation that was passed is that it gives the state about 13 months to decide if they really want to do it. It also means that there's about 13 months for Disney to have to either grovel, cajole, or deal with the legislature and the governor's office to make sure that everything's kind of on the up and up or that they don't get harmed too badly. So this is the dynamic we're in. Is there anything more behind this bill in terms of the politics of this that's worth noting? I mean, there's the, the timeline of it would make it seem like it is rather overtly political, and we'll be able to ask one of the state representatives yeah, in a moment, yeah. but go ahead, let the me, underpinnings me, of I'm this. I'm sorry to interrupt. Let me be clear. I, you know, I get criticized a lot on social media and in my reporting for kind of playing it straight down the line, and people say there's no such thing as neutrality. Well, there is, and there are certain things called facts, and the fact is, this is retribution. It's revenge. Disney decided to poke its head up 
and cross DeSantis and the Republican led legislature. And now it's finding there's a price to pay for that. Is it a First Amendment violation? We're going to find out because they might, Disney might challenge it. But if you look at the politics of it, it's really not in Disney's interest right now to provoke the legislature and Ron DeSantis more. This is one of the reasons that in the words of critics, it has a mafia like feel, which is sort of the legislature and Ron DeSantis saying, hey, nice theme park you have there. Shame if anything happens to it. So we're in that stage where they're going to have to kind of make a deal and they're going to have to talk to lawmakers and the like. So I think it's unlikely that there's going to be a lawsuit, but you don't know. Until then, what we can definitely say is we're in uncharted waters. This thing has existed for more than half a century, the Reedy Creek Improvement District. I was among those who was like, there's no way they're going to do this. Well, they're starting to do it. So kind of, you know, buckle up, put your mouthpiece in, and you're on. It could get bumpy out here. Can we also be clear, just zooming out a little bit, theme parks have enormous political and economic power in Central Florida. There'd probably be, people wouldn't even know the word Orlando if there was no Disney World. And we should be clear, NBC News is a corporate cousin of Universal Parks and Resorts, which is owned by NBC Universal and has its own relationship with state lawmakers. We'd be lying to say that we didn't have a dog in this fight, but the political power that these parks have, Disney, Universal, SeaWorld, which is headquartered in Orlando, is gigantic. And the idea that anyone from state government would seriously consider biting the hand that has fed it for 55 years, these waters are completely uncharted. Right. But you're also seeing an evolution of the Republican Party from sort of a business first, business friendly, the business of Florida is the business of the legislature change. And now the business of the Florida legislature and the business of the governor's office is steeped more in culture wars and more in immediate political calculation. And if the legislature has to choose between its parental rights legislation uh, or Disney, it's going to choose the parental rights legislation every time. It's a Republican -led legislature. Republicans like the legislation. And they don't like Disney getting involved in what they see as social issues, which are none of their business. And if they do, and they stick their head up, it's going to get hit. And so we're seeing them in real time uh, be on the receiving end of a blow in whack-a-mole. I also I want to ask you, Mark, before I got to let you go, about these new congressional maps and the changes to Florida's 5th and 10th congressional districts. We saw black lawmakers protest on the floor of the Florida House for a while to try to prevent those maps from being approved, and they were yet approved anyway. Where does that head from here, and what's the net effect of that look like? Well, the net effect, if it's going to be approved, understand my first legislative session that I covered was in 2002, 20 years ago, a redistricting session. I've never seen anything like this, nor of my uh, colleagues or peers uh, who predate my time covering Tallahassee. Uh, I do caution people in focusing too much on the 10th congressional district uh, and the loss of African-American voting power. There are a lot of demographic changes that are happening there, and it's difficult to say that, oh, that was clearly them eliminating a black-held African-American heavy seat. That's different in the 5th congressional district in North Florida. They are, lawmakers are, at Ron DeSantis's insistence, eliminating a seat held by an African-American lawmaker that is plurality black when it comes to the primary, almost majority black when it comes to the primary, and therefore performs as an African-American heavy seat and sort of a guaranteed seat. Another thing to focus on, if you look down at that map, the 13th and the 14th congressional district in the St. Pete area, that's a place where lawmakers, uh, Republican lawmakers, are going to be diluting the ability of Democrats to elect a more Democratic or likely more Democratic Congress person or member of Congress. What legislators did there in the peninsula of St. Pete is they took out the Democrat heavy areas of South St. Pete and East St. Pete, and they shipped them across the bay, Tampa Bay, to the 14th congressional district. Now, the southern part of St. Pete is a heavy African-American district. St. Pete is currently represented by a Democrat. By them doing this maneuver, it's probably going to be more likely represented now by a Republican if these seats remain as they are. And because of the late hour, so to speak, in the political calendar, it's likely that right. the maps that are just passed here are going to be the maps that have the districts that voters vote on in November. Now, if the courts change them in the future, that's going to be after the 2022 elections, more than likely.
Yeah, and if you ask folks who live in St. Pete, life on one side of the bay and on the other side of the bay, they are not the same place. So who represents those communities will make a difference. Thank you, Mark. That's NBC political reporter Mark Caputo starting us off from Florida. Let's continue now with Florida State Representative Randy Fine. He's a Republican representing a coastal district east of the theme parks, and he sponsored the House version of this bill. Representative Fine, welcome. It's good to see you again. Thank you, and I'm on my way home from Tallahassee, so you got me in my car. Oh, well, I, I, uh, I, hope you're, uh, I hope you're on the side of the road at least. I see that we're having a little trouble with your video, oh, yeah. but we'll, we won't no, keep no. you for too, too long. Good. good, we won't keep you for too, too long. Let me just ask you the most basic question. First of all, how does the passage of this bill regarding Disney make Florida a better place to live? Um, well, what it does is it addresses a problem that we discovered in the legislature when, that when the hornet's nest got kicked, which is we have six special districts in this state that were created before the Florida Constitution was put in place. And as a result, those six special districts have bizarre powers that we would never allow today. For example, one of them, they have the right to build a nuclear power plant without regulation. These are crazy things that when you have a law that's 55 years old, that's never been looked at, just don't make a lot of sense. What other problems have come up with these special districts? Can you, can you name one, lay one out? Sure. So, for example, in the Reedy Creek Improvement District, um, Disney has the right to seize private property without, without any permission from any other government. It's called eminent domain. Normally, we allow governments to do that. We've never allowed a company to do that. They, they are not subject to safety codes or building codes or zoning codes or road construction codes that any other government or any other entity in the state have to do. It's an extraordinary amount of power. It's, in effect, a seceding from the state of Florida and allowing a company to basically be its own county. What has Disney done to flout that power? I mean, have they ever actually done anything that would give Floridians pause? Sure. A number of years ago, Democrats were very upset um, when Disney went and took money that was available for public housing. They went, used it and said, hey, we're a government. We want to go grab this money. They beat Orlando to the punch. There's been a lot of upsetness with this over the last 55 years. But Disney has had so much political power, something that I think many on the left don't like, having businesses have so much political power, these issues were never able to be addressed. I think now, given Disney's actions in, a basic, in basically taking a dump on the head of Florida voters, Florida voters are like, look, they're a guest in our state. Maybe they shouldn't have these special privileges anymore. I don't understand what you mean when you say that Disney is a guest in our state. I mean... I grew up going to Disney World as a kid. The memories I have with my mother will be indelible for me for the rest of my life. I have family that has worked for Walt Disney World for generations now. So I don't understand what you mean when you say that they are a guest. If not for Disney, no one would know what Orlando is. I think that's a fair question, and I would answer it this way. Disney's a California company, and part of what is going on here is Disney's trying to bring California values to the state of Florida. Florida is not California. And we don't look at the world the same way that they do out there. And I think that when they've done that and, and really getting into an inappropriately um, discussing legislation that the legislature passed that is supported by the overwhelming majority of Floridians of all stripes, Republicans, Independents, Democrats, it's supported by Biden voters by a 23 point margin. Um, it's well, which look, which legislation are you California referring to, sir, when you say it's, it's supported? Which legislation are you referring to? Sure. We, we passed a parental rights and education bill um, earlier this year in our regular legislative session, which Disney came out, mischaracterized, said they were going to use the money they were able to save from this special district in order to try to roll that bill back. Well, I question whether or not majorities of Democrats in Florida support that bill, particularly because, and also kind of wonder how many people do support it, including a viewer that emailed us. I'd love you to respond directly to what Lisa wrote. Lisa writes, I truly hope that the Florida residents and taxpayers and Disney lovers do not suffer financially for the governor's agenda. Though I live overseas, military, I vote in Florida and always look forward to visiting Universal and Disney when we visit family. Those officials that vote against Disney are also voting against the tourist trade that makes Florida such a financially successful and vibrant state. Though I will continue to visit Disney and Universal, I will not vote for legislators who are behaving like very powerful children. Lisa, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. Representative Fine, what would you say to Lisa? It's a great email. I'd say two things. It's interesting that she notes 
Disney and Universal in the same email. Disney has four theme parks. Universal's building a third. Disney somehow is given special privileges that Universal does not. Universal has to abide by the laws of the counties and the cities where they operate. Why have we thought it's a good idea to give one theme park company special privileges, self-governance, but Universal or SeaWorld or Busch Gardens or Legoland, not the same thing. There's an issue of fundamental fairness. But on her concern about this costing taxpayers money, it won't. We're basically dissolving one government and we're moving it into another government. Those, all the taxes, all the revenues, all the expenses, all the assets, all the liabilities, it simply moves from one pocket to another. It won't affect taxpayers. I just want to be clear. The mayor of Orange County, Jerry Dimming, says that it will. He says that that will put well over $100 million of liabilities currently, debt liabilities that Disney otherwise would be able to kind of raise its own money to pay for, on his taxpayers. How do you, Representative Fine, who don't represent Orange County, know better what will happen to Orange County than people who do represent it? Well, he's actually wrong. It's not $100 million. It's $1.1 billion. But it's not Disney's That sounds debt. even worse. Debt. Well, it, it is until you understand the fact. That is debt held by a government. That debt would be transferred, for example, to Orange County. But the $200 million of taxes that is collected to pay that $1.1 billion of debt goes with it. So, yes, the debt transfers, but so do the revenues that pay for that debt. There will be no effect to taxpayers. In fact, there could be benefits. For example, Reedy Creek has its own fire department. Well, so does, so does Orange County. You won't need two, two fire chiefs if you merge these things together. There could be vast... That sounds like kind of a small... I, 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 I oh, got to sure. say, I got to stop you there, because that, sounds like, a, that, is that sounds like a benefit that yeah. is unknowable at this point, particularly because there may be other downstream issues. So I, I hear you on that, but... There is one other aspect of this I have to ask you about, and I've danced around it because I wanted sure. to give you a chance no to talk about this differently, but this bill feels like retaliation. It feels like Disney said, there's this thing that we don't like. We're going to fight it. And then state Republicans decided to kind of hit Disney in the kneecaps and prevent it from having the power that it had before to govern itself. Nothing about that, about taking retaliation against a company for its political stance feels at all conservative to me. It doesn't speak well of free enterprise. It doesn't speak well of letting people have their own political views, their own political advocacy. How is this not a political hit on Disney? Well, I think you can make the argument that it is. Had Disney not done what they had done, we would not have begun taking a look at special districts and realized that we had six, not just Disney, but five others, that had these pre-constitutional problems. But look, when you're a guest in another state, when my son wants special privileges, which is what Disney has, he acts on his best behavior. All this elimination does is say Disney will be treated exactly the same way as its competitors. I think you could make an argument that there was retribution if we said, we're going to treat Disney worse. And sorry about that. We're going to treat Disney worse than we treat Universal Orlando. But we're not doing that. We're saying you're going to be treated exactly the same. I don't know how you can argue that's retribution. I want to make sure I heard what you said correctly. It sounds like you said that this was causally connected to Disney saying that it opposed the parental rights and education bill. What happened is when Disney kicked a hornet's nest, people started calling us to look at special districts. And we looked at special districts and we discovered there were six of them. Only one affects Disney that were formed before the Florida Constitution was put into place. And unlike 127 others, had never been updated in the last 55 years. Well, Florida None was of not which like would have happened if Disney had not come out against this bill, though. Absolutely. We would, not, we would not have identified the problem if the hornet's nest had not been kicked. But in Florida, when we identify problems, we're not Washington, D.C. We don't pass a continuing resolution and say we'll deal with it next year. We deal with it right away, and that's what we've done this week. Florida State Representative Randy Fine, I appreciate you making time tonight. Good to see you again, sir. Thank you very much. Be here. Thanks. As we mentioned, Disney is feeling the political fallout after speaking up for LGBT children in Florida. Today, state lawmakers voted to strip Disney World of the self-governing status it has had since the 1950s. This started, as Representative Fine himself just said, when executives and cast members spoke out against a bill called the Parental Rights in Education Bill. It's the one that some critics refer to as the Don't Say Gay Bill. Now, after that bill was signed into law, Disney released a statement saying, quote, 
Our goal as a company is for this law to be repealed by the legislature or struck down in the courts, unquote. Governor Ron DeSantis at the time fired back, setting today's vote in motion. For Disney to come out and put a statement and say that the bill should have never passed and that they are going to actively work to repeal it, I think one was fundamentally dishonest, but two, I think that crossed the line. This state is governed by the interests of the people of the state of Florida. It is not based on the demands of California corporate executives. A number of Disney cast members protested the bill before it became law, as did many LGBTQ activists. So what happens now? And what is it like being LGBTQ in Florida these days? Let's continue now with Brandon Wolf, the press secretary for the LGBTQ civil rights organization, Equality Florida. Mr. Wolf, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thanks for having me. How does the passage of this bill, and we're awaiting word on Governor DeSantis signing it into law, presumably he will, but how does the passage of this bill fit into the overall condition of what it's like to be LGBTQ in Florida these days? Well, first of all, I just want to thank you for your questioning there of Representative Fine. Um, he is nothing if not candid and honest, even when uh, on a show like this one. And he just told you the quiet part out loud that Republicans in Florida are very happy to use the power of government as a weapon, that they wield it not to make life better for Floridians, uh, not to address the property insurance crisis, not to address rising home prices, not to address crumbling buildings in parts of South Florida, uh, not to address climate change, but rather uh, as a bludgeon against political dissenters who dare to stand in the way of the right-wing agenda of this out-of-control governor. And you heard it from Governor Ron DeSantis there, that essentially what he's saying is that anyone who opposes his train that's barreling toward running for president in 2024 is going to feel the weight and might of the governor's mansion and of the state legislature. And the really terrifying part is that that weighs most heavily on LGBTQ people right now. We know that the uh, the don't say gay law, or as Representative Fine said, the parental rights and education law uh, is targeting LGBTQ people. It is designed, as the Senate sponsor told us, to stop young people from feeling comfortable enough to come out as LGBTQ while they're in school. It's designed to censor conversations about us. It's already being used to rip books with queer characters off of shelves across the state of Florida. Uh, and so Disney took a stand. They, they listened to their cast members. Uh, they said that they don't support a bill that would seek to erase LGBTQ people from classrooms and would only seek to do harm to LGBTQ young people. And as a result, as you've heard tonight and you heard from the governor, Republicans in Florida are willing to punish them for it. I do want to also follow up on something that Representative Fine said, where he said that this bill had support from majorities of voters. He might be looking at other data, but there is a University of North Florida poll that was conducted in early to mid-February in which 49% of voters, registered Florida voters, said they disapprove of the bill. 40% said they approve, and the margin of error was less than 4%. So that is a statistically significant majority or plurality that says they disapprove of the bill. That's according to a poll from the University of North Florida. Mr. Wolf, what do you make of this whole situation, the way all of this has been handled? It feels like there's a lot of blame to go around, and this has gotten super complicated because Disney at first was kind of tepid in the way it handled this, and then LGBTQ cast members jumped up and they were like, why aren't we saying anything? And then Disney CEO Bob Chapek said something, and then this bill come up, comes up. Meanwhile, SeaWorld and our corporate cousin at Universal have said nothing. This feels like a really messy situation. Well, it's only messy because we have a governor, once again, who's obsessed with using the government to control people. Uh, governor Ron DeSantis is, uh, you know, is solely focused, singularly focused on running for president in a couple of years. And he's looking to whip up right wing frenzy on his way there. And so, you know, as it started with the, the 2021 legislative session when the governor uh, took on 13 and 14 year old kids on a soccer field uh, and then moved into this legislative session where he served up a buffet of culture war issues. Uh, that included anti-CRT legislation. It included what we saw today, which was the breaking up of majority black congressional districts. And it, of course, included this uh, don't say gay law. 
And, and so what you're witnessing is a, a governor who is barreling toward his own political ambitions, looking for anyone to step on to climb up to the next rung of the ladder. And you have a legislature that's wholly owned by him. They have totally abdicated their responsibilities uh, and their jobs. And they've said, we'll rubber stamp whatever the governor wants to sign off on for his agenda. And so that's put you know our business partners in Florida in a very difficult situation because they have cast members to tend to. They have employees to tend to. Uh, they have communities that they do business in. Uh, and so they're put in this really difficult position of how do we remain an inclusive and affirming place for people to visit, a place for people to work? How do we attract the very best talent in the world to be able to fill spots, especially at a time uh, when, when spots are really difficult to fill, when we have this right. legislature that is hell bent on punishing people for being who they are. Uh, and, and I appreciate you pointing out that more people need to come to the table. I think a lot of people waited to see what Disney would do uh, in order to, to form their own opinions of how they should move forward. We really need businesses to get off the sideline because we don't combat this assault on freedom by simply sitting on our hands and waiting for somebody else to take the bludgeon. We all have an obligation to step up and stand in solidarity with marginalized people, especially LGBTQ well, young people, uh, against this runaway governor's agenda. Well, one of our viewers would agree with you. Melissa emailed, I'm glad that Disney has decided to stand up for LGBT youth. However, as one of the largest production and broadcasting corporations, the Walt Disney Company and ABC do not do nearly enough to rescue LGBT youth as they should or could, especially when it comes to equal representation in media. Melinda, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. One more thing before I, I got to let you go in a second, but there is a counter argument and it kind of reflects part of what Representative Fine said that is part of the political you know, bloodstream in Florida that corporations like Disney, Universal, and others have gotten too mired in all these cultural issues that we can't even really benefit from their services the way we used to. We just want to be able to take our kids to these parks, have a good time, and not have to think about all these other cultural issues when we get there. That's what we have always paid these parks for. That's what we want to pay them for now. And if they don't do that, then we have the right as Floridians to clap back against that for people who feel like they don't want these experiences at the parks to be dragged into these so-called culture wars, what would you say to them? Well, you know, first and foremost, I would say if your experience at a theme park or at any business is tampered by the fact that that business wants to be open and inclusive of all people, we may have to have a, a conversation about, about why your, your experience is being negatively impacted. Listen, I, as I mentioned, these businesses have a responsibility, not just to their employees, but to the communities that they serve to reflect those communities. And I think that Disney took a look at what their employees were saying. They took a look at this piece of legislation. They sat in meetings with the governor uh, and they came to the conclusion that this piece of legislation simply does not match that company's values, that it, it doesn't match uh, where the company is in terms of wanting to open their gates to absolutely everyone. Uh, and that you know went further for the company to say, yeah, we, we do need to look at uh, whether or not our content is representative of the community as a whole. And that's what's led to this outrage. And I just want to put a finer note on it, that what you heard from Representative Fine tonight uh, is that he admitted that they're willing to use government power selectively against those who dissent. Uh, this is not about you know, trying to set a, a singular standard across the state. This is a threat to anyone who stands up, not just businesses, but individuals, and says, I disagree with what's happening in Tallahassee. I disagree with what this governor is trying to ram down our throats, uh, that Representative Fine and others have said, we will exact political retribution against you if you dare to speak out against us. And I do want to be clear, you know, Universal and SeaWorld may not have the kind of governmental structure that the Walt Disney World Resort has, but they have their relationships with state and local government as well. And I assure you, Universal would not be building a brand new park called Epic Universe across the street from their main park if it wasn't economically and governmentally advantageous. So they all have their unique relationships with the state, just not as unique as what Disney World has. Brandon Wolf of Equality Florida. Mr. Wolf, I appreciate you making time, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Up next, we'll shift gears to the latest from Ukraine. Russia is claiming victory in Mariupol, even though soldiers and civilians are still trapped there. We're live in Lviv with more. And later, the impact on crime labs 
in the United States. A key supply is running low. We'll tell you just ahead. Stay close. The U.S. is preparing to send Ukraine hundreds of millions of dollars more military aid. It will come in handy, especially with more fighting in Mariupol. Today, President Biden announced an additional $800 million of aid that includes some heavy artillery. He also announced $500 million of economic aid, and it all seems desperately needed, especially since it is unclear who exactly controls the southern port city of Mariupol. It's been under siege for weeks now. Today, Russian President Vladimir Putin claimed success there, so much so that he says he has decided not to storm the site where the remaining Ukrainian forces are barricaded. Instead, he is calling for a blockade tight enough that, in his words, not even a fly comes through. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky admits the situation in Mariupol is dire. However, he has not conceded defeat to Russia there. Neither has the U.S. It's questionable whether he does control Mariupol. There is no evidence yet that Mariupol is completely fallen. Meanwhile, the Russian offensive in eastern Ukraine is ramping up. The governor of Luhansk says the situation there is critical. 80 percent, 80 percent of the area is now under Russian control. NBC's Ali Aruzi joins us again from Lviv with more. Uh, Ali, what do we make of what Russia said about what's happening in Mariupol compared to what's actually happening there. Uh, hi, hey, Joshua. Look, all, all, from all the accounts we're getting here, they are in charge of large swathes of Mariupol. Maybe not the entire city, but certainly the majority of the city. And look, for the last uh, two months, they have been pounding that city. They've destroyed 90% of it. They've burnt it out. Uh, and they've used uh, siege and starvation tactics uh, to encircle that city. And that circle has gotten tighter and tighter as the bombardment has become more intense. And now, basically, Basically, it's encircled the uh, Azovtol steel plant, where a handful of fighters are holed up in there with uh, several hundred civilians in the basement. Uh, and as you explained earlier, Vladimir Putin has said he's going to tie that place up so tight that not even a fly can get in. So he's basically forcing the people in there to either surrender uh, or, or starve to death. And, and that seems to be the situation on the ground in Mariupol. It's been very desperate throughout this war, but the last few days have been even worse. Look, even the Azov fighters who were there a couple of days ago put a video message out saying that if a third party can broker their exit out of that city, and especially the civilians, they would take it. Obviously, that hasn't happened, and the Russians are by and large in control of that city from everything we're hearing, but not its entirety. And this has been a major ob objective for the Russians. They want a big victory for the 9th of May, which is Victory Day in Russia where they celebrate the defeat of the Nazis. And this would be a huge victory for Vladimir Putin to celebrate, to sell to his domestic audience uh, back in Russia. President Biden announced this new aid to Ukraine today. And before I ask you about that, I just want to get to an update from the president's visit in Seattle today. He is there, attended a fundraiser, or excuse me, Portland, Oregon, I beg your pardon, in Portland attended a fundraiser, spoke for just under a half hour, and among other things, according to the pool reporter, President Biden said he's not going to, in his words, send a single American troop into Ukraine to start World War III. That's from President Biden at a Democratic fundraiser this evening in Portland, Oregon, but says that the U.S. will continue to give Ukraine support to protect itself. Uh, Ali Aruzi, tell us more about this military aid and the role that it might play, particularly since there are certain parts of this war where Ukraine might want to turn the tide really quickly. Well, look, the Ukrainians really want uh, very advanced hardware and they want the skies closed. You mentioned the, the governor of Luhansk. I spoke to him a couple of days ago uh, and he said, look, we really need the skies closed. But he realized that's not going to happen. So short of that, they're asking for artillery. They're asking for these javelins because that really is tipping the scales in the favor of the Ukrainians. Without that, it would be a real uphill struggle for them to fight the Russian war machine, which is, you know, much better 
armed than the Ukrainians. I mean, you know, the Ukrainians will tell you time and time again, all that money that they've been getting to selling energy from Europe has been going to funding this war for, for the last uh, eight years. They've been planning this for a long time. So the Ukrainians really need that kind of hardware. And it's proved very effective here. The Javelins have proved incredibly effective for the Ukrainians taking out Russian tanks. Uh, and as the governor of Luhansk said to me the other day, he said, this is now a battle of artillery. So they really need those howitzers to provide that artillery fire against the Russians. But they're also saying that their stocks are depleted uh, and the Russians are also hitting their warehouses where they're keeping this stuff. And they say if those are not rearmed fast enough, it's going to be very dangerous for them. It will allow Russian tanks to roll into territories, you know, sort of un unchecked. And he also told me that uh, their stocks are getting what they have to, it's meant to last about a week in this battle. They're going through in about a day or two. So they need those supply lines coming in much faster to help them fend off the Russians. And very briefly, Ali, Russia slapped some new sanctions on U.S. officials, including the vice president. What message are they trying to send right now with those sanctions? They must know it's not going to have that big of an effect, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the, these are symbolic, these sanctions that they're slapping on them, and they've slapped them onto European Union officials. It's basically a message for the, their, their domestic audience in Russia to say this is a, an unjust move against uh, Russia from the United States. NBC's Ali Aruzi in Lviv for us. Ali, good to see you. Thank you very much. Please stay safe. Let me just reiterate, by the way, the notes from President Biden speaking in Portland. He spoke at a Democratic fundraiser this evening. And in off-camera notes from the pool reporter, pool is basically the network send one person so that everyone doesn't have to have a reporter in the room and they share out the notes. The pool reporter said that with regard to Ukraine, the president said, it takes time and effort, but I'm not going to send a single American troop into Ukraine to start World War III, meaning he would be sending supplies and military aid, but not American boots on the ground. We'll get to some of today's other top stories in just a moment including Johnny Depp's defamation trial against his ex-wife, Amber Heard. Plus, the Supreme Court issued some new rulings today worth knowing about. The defamation trial continues between actor Johnny Depp and his ex-wife. Today in Virginia, he took the stand for a third time. Each is accusing the other of domestic abuse. Today, lawyers for his ex, Amber Heard, focused on explicit text messages that he sent. The next text down, you say, let's drown her before we burn her. Three exclamation points. Did I read that right? Yes, it's referring and, and, to the and text you didn't, prior to. You, you, you didn't stop. And you said, let's drown her before we burn her. After that, you made another comment. After you said, let's drown her before we burn her, Mr. Depp, yes. you said, I will f her burnt corpse afterwards to make sure she is dead. That's what you said that you would do after you burned her and after you drowned her. Did I read that right? You certainly did, yes. And you wrote that about the woman who would later become your wife. Yes, I did. Okay. NBC Steve Patterson joins us now with more. Steve, what was the strategy behind Amber Heard's attorneys of reading those texts in particular? What were they trying to establish? So this was a veritable treasure trove of exhibits. I would estimate that Depp and that attorney spent more time staring at screens than they did each other, one after another, after another, after another. I'd say the vast majority of them focused more on his drug use, but then almost like a narrative that was being built that would end in a crescendo or a climax. You'd have this sudden burst of violence in one of those text messages. The most famous, uh, you just played for us, but there were more and it was a multimedia affair. You You'd heard audio of Depp screaming or video of him slamming cabinetry. Uh, or again, those, those text messages displaying some sort of violence. And I think the overall strategy was one of a sledgehammer to uh, show so much of this to convince the jury that this is not just a standard case 
of a domestic dispute, that this is more extreme than that. Have the jury think that, oh, man, this is actually much more extreme than I thought, I think is the strategy uh, from the attorneys for Amber Heard and for Depp just trying to combat at every turn this attorney who would go over these materials again and again and again until, you know, finally they would either come to a dispute or, or talk more about the next slide that would then appear right after the, the former one. Josh? And then in addition to this, they also focused on his past substance use, right? Yeah, so I think, again, the majority of them were focused on the substance abuse because th it's core to both arguments, right? For Johnny Depp, he, he says that Amber Heard would blow his substance abuse out of proportion, calling him a monster, um, and that there were actually long periods, according to Depp, of sobriety or attempts at sobriety, that he was trying to get clean on many attempts, and that she would bar him or prevent him from doing that or even encourage him to use substances. That's part of his argument. Her argument is that there were drugs and alcohol all the time. The alcohol would fuel the rage. The rage would fuel the domestic violence. That's core to what each one of them has been saying about this, uh, and core to Johnny Depp's argument that this somehow led to that 2018 op-ed that led to his defamation. Joshua. And I just want to be clear, Steve, very briefly, I think it's easy to look at this case from the outside and be like, ah, another celebrity case in court. Is this just a celebrity case in court, or is there something more to it underneath this case? There's, there's wide implications because, uh, one, you're talking about a, a man who's described domestic violence when it comes to men, not only with Amber Heard, but also talking about his family growing up. That's Johnny Depp. He said his mother was violent. His father hit him at least once. Something you don't hear all the time, but I think more pertinent to this, uh, this has implications for survivors of domestic violence. If this goes one way or another, it could make things a whole lot more difficult uh, just based upon this singular case, which has so much celebrity, so much weight uh, behind it, that things may be more difficult uh, if, say, Johnny Depp wins this case or Amber Heard, depending upon who you are and, and what you've been accused of. Joshua? Thank you, Steve. That's NBC Steve, pa Steve Patterson with the latest on this case. Meanwhile, at the Supreme Court, justices handed down five new opinions. Now, these cases were not the huge hot-button issues the court's considering on things like affirmative action or gun rights or abortion, but two cases in particular do give us a lot to unpack. NBC Justice correspondent Pete Williams has more on that. People who live in the U.S. territory of Puerto Rico are subject to most of the same laws as those who live on the mainland, but there are some exceptions. For example, they don't pay most federal income, gift, estate, and excise taxes, and as a result, they don't get some federal benefits, including payments under the Supplemental Security Income Program. SSI, that's intended to help people over 65 who cannot financially support themselves. And the question for the Supreme Court was whether that distinction violates the Constitution's guarantee of equal protection. And by a vote of 8 to 1, the court today said the answer is no. The opinion, written by Justice Brett Kavanaugh, said Congress can make these kinds of distinctions as long as it has a sound basis for doing so. And he pointed to past Supreme Court rulings that said because residents of Puerto Rico don't pay federal income taxes, then exempting them from some benefit programs is justified. The single dissenter was Justice Sonia Sotomayor, whose parents came from Puerto Rico. She said there is no rational basis for treating needy citizens living anywhere in the U.S. so differently from others. The second case involves an impressionist painting worth millions that was used as a bargaining chip with the Nazis. And the issue is, where can the American heirs to the original owner sue to get it back? It's called Rue Saint Honoré in the Afternoon, Effective Rain by Camille Pissarro. A German Jewish art dealer bought it in 1900 and his daughter inherited it. And then in 1939, she surrendered the painting to the Nazis in return for an exit visa to England to flee Germany. It wound up in an art gallery in St. Louis, then in a private home in Switzerland, and finally wound up with a foundation owned by the Spanish government. The heirs discovered it was there when a friend of theirs spotted it in a catalog of the foundation's collection, and Spain said, in essence, finders keepers. The heirs to the German family want it back, and today the Supreme Court ruled unanimously that they can sue in a U.S. court, not a Spanish court, applying the property law of California where they live.
Justice Elena Kagan wrote the ruling. It's short, just eight pages. She says the path of the court's decision has been as short as the hunt for the painting was long. Joshua. Thank you, Pete. That was NBC Justice correspondent Pete Williams. The war in Ukraine is causing a shortage of helium. You might be surprised just how much we need this gas, including for running crime labs. We'll explain before we go. We've heard a lot about supply chains and shortages in the last few years. Well, Russia's war in Ukraine is making it harder to get a number of things, from cars to medical equipment to even helium. Now, we've had helium shortages before, but it's not hard to see how much more useful this gas is besides filling party balloons. Helium is key to electronics manufacturing. You need it to make computer chips. Liquid helium is critical to space flight. Last month, an executive for SpaceX told CNBC its launches will cost more, partly because of this gas. It's one of the reasons it's raising prices. Helium is also used to cool down MRI machines. And according to the Miami Herald, the Miami-Dade Police Department uses helium to analyze drug samples. These days, the department says it's paying $1,800 per tank. And officials say that led them to take some of their drug testing machines offline. So where do we get helium from? And how do we address this shortage? Let's get into that with Phil Kornbluth, president of Kornbluth Helium Consulting. Mr. Kornbluth, welcome. Good to have you with us. Uh, hi, Joshua. Thanks for uh, having me on your show. So, How uh, is it that we have a shortage of the second most abundant element in the universe? <laughs> How does that work? Why is helium in short supply? Okay, well, helium that's uh, used commercially is produced as a byproduct of natural gas processing and LNG production. And, you know, not all of the uh, natural gas that's produced in the world has uh, commercially uh, recoverable uh, concentrations of helium. So it's relatively scarce on Earth. And there are only 15 uh, large liquid helium uh, plants uh, in the world. Seven of them are in the U.S., eight of them are outside of the U.S. There is helium in the atmosphere, but it is such a small concentration of the atmosphere that it's not economically viable to recover helium from the air. How is the war in Ukraine affecting these supplies? Are there specific impacts from this war? Or is it kind of generalized supply chain disruption? Well, uh, actually, uh, Joshua, there was a pretty severe shortage of helium that started before the war uh, in Ukraine. And the, the biggest factor in the shortage, uh, it coincidentally, has something to do with Russia, because Gazprom was planning to bring on a very, very large new helium source in Siberia called the Amur Project. And after briefly running that project uh, for a few weeks in September, uh, they experienced a fire in October. They had an explosion and a fire in uh, early January. And that plant, which was going to bring on a lot of new supply in 2022 and actually uh, take us out of the era of, uh, you know, recurring shortages, that plant is now out of the picture because of that, uh, those uh, fires and the explosion uh, throughout all of 2022. Now, the interesting thing about the war in Ukraine is, well, the, uh, the war in Ukraine has had a little bit of an impact in the short term, but the bigger impact of the war is that it's going to be? It's going to take a lot longer to restart the uh, plant in in, Amor, in Russia because it will be difficult for foreign experts to travel to uh, uh, to Russia to uh, work on the plant, and it'll also be difficult to uh, obtain spare parts, replacement parts, and equipment that are sourced right. from Europe or America. Give me an example of where the everyday person who is not trying to fill up party balloons will actually notice the shortage of helium? Where might it affect our lives, perhaps in ways we might not necessarily think of? Well, you know, that's, that's actually a tough question because I think, you know, helium is primarily not a consumer good. Uh, the, uh, the place where, you know, the average person interacts with helium is party balloons. If they go get balloons at, at the, the party store, they might not be able to get balloons because they're out of helium where the, the, the party balloons might cost more. Uh, you know, clearly, um, you know, MRI is a, an, uh, you know, a 
the, probably the biggest application for helium along with uh, semiconductor manufacturing. And I would bet that most uh, people who undergo MRI scans don't realize that liquid helium is cooling that magnet that is at the guts of an MRI scanner to uh, superconducting temperatures. It's a superconducting magnet. So probably MRI would be the uh, the place where uh, you know it would impact the average person. And other other than that, you know, the price of helium has gone up and. Uh, uh, it's another factor that uh, contributes to, uh, you know, the high inflation environment that we are experiencing right now. As I understand it, there are certain strategic reserves, like there's a U.S. reserve of helium, as I understand it, but there's trouble accessing it. There's some kind of damage or repairs that need to be done. What's the prospect for getting that fixed so that that can be tapped? Yeah. Well, the uh, U.S. Bureau of Land Management, that's part of the Department of the Interior, they actually uh, operate, they, they are the uh, operator for the Federal Reserve, which is uh, near Amarillo, Texas. And they also operate a, a pipeline system that delivers helium from the Federal Reserve to four helium purification and liquefaction plants that are located in uh, Oklahoma and, and Kansas. And that plant, the BLM's plant, uh, it's called the Crude Helium Enrichment Unit, but basically it's a a purifier, that plant has been down since mid-January, and that is greatly reducing the amount of feed gas to those four uh, liquid helium plants and taking a pretty large increment of supply out of the market, you know, a 10% plus increment. So that's a, another significant factor in the current shortage. Now, the good news, hopefully, is that the, uh, the BLM's uh, crude helium enrichment unit is expected to restart sometime between May 1st and June 1st. So if, if things go according to plan, we will get that supply back into the market and that should provide some uh, relief uh, for the shortage in the second half of the year. Now, I'm not saying the shortage is gonna end, but I think expectations are that it will be a little less severe uh, after the BLM restarts their plan. Phil Kornbluth of Kornbluth Helium Consulting. Appreciate you making time, sir. Thank you very much. All right, Joshua. Thank you. Bye-bye. And thank you for making time for us. Remember to keep an eye out for part two of our pot equity series. Morgan Radford brought you part one last night focused on New Jersey. Next week, we head to California and Massachusetts, where equity applicants have been in business there for years. Part two airs on Wednesday. Do share your stories about how the push for pot equity has affected you. Feel free to email us, leave us a voicemail, or reach out on social. But until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Look forward to hearing more of your stories, and we'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.